بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد إخوة الإسلام عباد الله this particular discussion is directed to brothers and possibly sisters that have accepted Islam but are still gang affiliated, still gang related, still are participating in the street life, still uh, living by the quote-unquote G-code. This is directed to you as advice from your brother uh, with the hopes that the advice be taken and whoever hears it that's in a situation and or condition benefits from it. Now, I want to begin this advice with a premise on a verse. The verse being that which is found in Surah Al Hadid, where Allah says, Alam yetni lilladina amenu, and tachsha a kulubuhum li vikri la, wame nezale min al haqqa, wale yakunu kelladina utul kitaba min kablu, fatale alayhim ul amed, thakasat kulubuhum wa kathirum min hum fasikum. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, he states, has the time, time not come for those who, who believe their hearts to be humbled as a result or on account of the remembrance of Allah and, that which, and due to that which he has revealed from the truth and to not be like those that receive the books prior, receive the book prior. Uh... Yani, their time period or their duration was prolonged and their hearts became hardened and an abundance from amongst them were sinful and or disobedient. Has the time not come for our hearts to be humbled from the remembrance of Allah and not to be like those that came before us? Some of those that came before us were those that adopted the characteristic of having knowledge, but not acting in accordance with that knowledge. And unfortunately, some from amongst the Muslims, people that accept Islam, regardless if they accept Islam in the penitentiary or by some other means, we are falling into this. Why? Because we learn what caused us to make this covenant with Allah when we say La ilaha illallah but unfortunately and then we may learn other aspects how to pray the, some of the details concerning cer certain pillars of Al-Islam how to pray and how to fast properly but unfortunately we don't implement that and we some of us are Muslims with one foot in one foot out the deen one foot in and one foot out the thing. Now, I want to t say or mention some, something that happened with me in my life. I moved to, a, to as, a, as a child in junior high, my mother moved me to an area within LA, 88th Place and Central. Uh, we lived on 88th Place between Central and Hooper, not Hoover but Hooper, H-O-O-P-E-R, right? And if anybody from L.A. knows this particular area, that was the outskirts of Watts because all you had to do was go down to 92nd Street and you pass 92nd Street and you were considered to be in Watts. As it relates to the gang territory, that was 8-9 East Coast Crip Hood. The 87 gangs, the 87 Kitchen Crips were a little further down the street. 
and then central was the, div the divider the east side of central was the crypt side the west side of central was the blood side you have the family swan bloods on the other side of central when I moved over there I was young I was still in junior high I think I was around 11 maybe 12 years old and we had young friends within the neighborhood when I say we mean me and my brother me and my older brother we had a friend that lived right down the street named Michael and we had a friend that lived around the corner directly behind Michael named Kirby Michael eventually as we got older because he moved away but I remember running into him after I was a crip and he was from a gang called Nuthood Watts who were crips Kirby, on the other hand, ended up becoming from 8-9 East Coast Crip, the same neighborhood that we lived in. Now again, we were childhood friends. We were friends before any of us started banging any gang. But when Kirby became from 8-9 East Coast Crip, shortly after that, and this is fairly young as well, he, I, he was still... We were still around the ages of junior high because he had became from 890s Coast Crip years before I started banging. I, had, I didn't start banging until I was in high school. But at any rate, when he, when he got quoted on 890s Coast, it wasn't long before he caught a case. He caught a case for a kidnapping, a kidnap, kidnap robbery. He, was, he participated in some type of kidnap robbery or he was an accessory to it. So he got locked up and I hadn't seen him, me nor my brother hadn't seen him for years after that because of, you know, him being locked up. And Kirby, he was a uh, little sea dog from, from 8, 9 East Coast. He's either little sea dog or baby sea dog. I, I can't remember what I'm... I'm almost sure he was little sea dog but at any rate he hops out of jail I remember when he got out um, after a long period of time when he gets out of jail of course we're all older now uh, I was still living on 88th place in Central so of course I was still a teenager but I, I believe it was in my later teens around like 17 something like that and by that time I was I was fully initiated into the gang. When he hopped out, he, of course, he's still from 8, 9 East Coast. You know, uh, people have been waiting for him to get out. You know, uh, he had a name and a reputation around the neighborhood because that was their territory. And uh, when he got out and he saw us and saw us banging and we, we were from a totally different hood, you know, it still was, there was no problems between us. Of course, he were just people who got older and grew apart all his years of being in jail and then what we had gotten into. But there was no problems, there was no issues between us. He would come and hang out for a short period of time and then he would go further down the street, deeper into 8, 9, East Coast hood where they actually hung out at. There was an incident that took place. <clears throat> I had a partner from my gang who was my best friend at that time, uh, Smurf Loke or Smurf. Uh, when, when we, we, when me and my family, when we moved off the east side, we moved to the Lamar Park area in, in Los Angeles, was way on the west side, the Crenshaw district. And after we had moved away, we still, we, we, we still would hang on the east side where we lived at. It wasn't. It was less than a year before we just totally disconnected from that, but we would still be over there. Now, keep in mind, I was a crip, so I had certain habits, you know, negative habits that I'm not going to reveal at the moment uh, because because it's not worth it's not that's not the point, right? But at any rate, um, there was a situation where there was there was a guy that lived around like two streets down on 90th Street. Again, I, we were on 88th Place. Uh, after 88th place, there was 89th Street, then there was 89th place, and then there was 90th Street. So, 
There was a young guy named J Bone. Of course, he's probably not young now, and I don't even know if he's still alive or not. But there was a guy named J Bone. He was from a hood called Dark Side Hustler, and his brother. And I'm naming names. I don't. I don't care. Nothing's gonna happen to me. I don't care about that. I'm not a part of that G code stuff anymore. I could care less about it. It's self-destructive. That's why I'm naming names and gangs. I don't care about that. So at any rate, even if I was in L.A., I would have no fear of anything happening to me. So J Bone, anyway. So as I was saying, J Bone had a brother that was like a big-time drug dealer, or has some, or he was uh, dealing drugs, right? And so. Um, J Bone would sell for him, and so I remember uh, he, and he one of the things he would sell was chronic, right? And so my best friend at that time, Smurf, uh, he went he would go around there when he would come around because Smurf lived in our so-called hood on 108th Street, but he would come over to our house, and sometimes he would go to J Bone and buy some stuff. You know, uh, you know, buy some weed from him and like this. So, one, so after we moved away, Smurf had a counterfeit twenty-dollar bill. He was like, "Man, let's go around the corner, man. I, I got this. I got this." He let us know he had a fake bill. You know, we were driving. He drove around the corner to buy some chronic from J Bone, and he slipped J Bone a fake twenty-dollar bill. J Bone looked at the twenty dollar bill, saw it was fake, but gave him the weed anyway. Then when we leave, you know, uh, of course, that didn't go well concerning J Bone and his brother and like this. But we had already moved away. Uh, Smurf was the one that that did that. So just based off the street code. That had nothing to do with us. That was a transaction between Smurf and J Bone. My brother just happened to drive Smurf around there so he can make the transaction. And I was in the car and another cat named Big Bob or Bobcat was in the car with us who lived in the neighborhood. So at this time, again, Kirby or Lil Sea Dog, he was out of jail. He had got out from the, after doing all those years. Now, Lil C Dog, he was the ba he was dealing with dating or whatever or fornicating uh, with J Bone's sister and had a baby by J Bone's sister. So when the whole incident with the twenty the fake twenty dollar bill happened. Instead of them going after Smurf or being mad at Smurf and like this, they tried to sink, they tried to go after everybody in the car. When my brother drove Smurf around there, Smurf hopped out the car, went into the yard and dealt with J Bone directly, and came back to the car, hopped in, and we drove off. So from a gang perspective, we really didn't have nothing to do with that. That was between J Bone and Smurf. But they act like they were, I don't know what J-Bone told those, his brother and whoever else. Maybe he told them some out, out, outrageous story. Allah knows best. But Lil Sea Dog inserted himself into that because he was dealing with J-Bone's sister. And so now J-Bone, uh, now uh, Lil Sea Dog and J-Bone's older brother were mad at me and my brother along with Bobcat for that situation that happened. And of course they, they mad at Smurf, but they wasn't gonna do anything to Smurf. I mean, they weren't gonna do anything to us. They didn't do anything to us neither. neither. But uh, somehow they ended up getting my phone number and I, I'm getting all these calls. This guy named Lil Assassin calling me, uh, Lil Sea Dog calling me, when we see you, we're gonna do this and that to you, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here like, okay, well, if you wanna come meet us, we're on 108 in town. We're gonna be there at this time. You know, that was our gang territory. You want to come see us, come see us in the hood. If y'all act like y'all mad like that, come see us over there. That's how, that was me and my brother's attitude. They didn't have no numbers on Smurf, you know, uh, because Smurf wasn't from around the, that neighborhood that we grew up in. He just used to come over there because he was visiting us. And we were, oh, and, was, and a lot of times that would be short lived because we would end up going to the hood anyway. But at any rate, that's what I remember of Sea Dog. 
right? That he had a problem with us, and that was why. Now, again, he was, we were already on Lamert at that point. They didn't know where we, where we lived, and they wasn't going to come to the hood. So it was like, okay, <laughs> you know. So Lil Sea Dog ended up going to jail again, you know, a couple of years. I'm not sure how much time went by, but the bottom line is eventually I end up getting with the Muslims. Allah to Barak wa Ta'ala put, put, affected my heart and guided me to start to practice Islam. The deen that I was born in, but, you know, wasn't practicing as I was growing up. And so Allah guided my heart to, uh, to, to, to practice Islam. And of course, when I started practicing Islam, it was a journey because at first I was with the WD community until I eventually got with this. I think I was with the WD community at least a, a, the, the, the first full year before I ended up getting with the Salafi community. But by the time I ended up getting with the Salafi community, I went all out. I, started, I changed my dress code and everything. And this was very important in L.A., as not to be identified with anyone or anything outside of Islam, especially considering the fact that when I was a crip, I did accumulate enemies. And some enemies I saw after Islam. And when they saw me in thobes and kufi and beard, uh, their attitudes uh, of what they, the hostility that they had for me in the past, totally changed when they saw me as a Muslim. And that's the power of Islam. That's the power of Islam. So one of those situations was Lil Sea Dog. Uh, after being Muslim for a couple of years, I went to the old neighborhood to, you know, just visiting the old neighborhood where I grew up at. Not the gang territory that I was banging at, because I didn't live in my gang territory. In fact, I don't. I wouldn't. I don't even go over there. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't go over there, you know. Um, and now, so much has changed. That's over over twenty years ago. I probably wouldn't know half those young faces anyway. But anyway, I went to the old neighborhood, and uh, you know, uh, I was visiting Bobcat because again, these are childhood friends, or child people that I knew since my childhood, right? So I was visiting Bobcat and a couple of other people in the neighborhood on the street that we grew up on. And of course I was had on the white though, uh Kufi and like this. I hop out, um, you know, I had dealt with some neighbors and then I ended up seeing Bobcat, went down to his house, I'm in his yard, I'm talking to him. You know, and again, like I said, I'm though I'm throw I have on a white though and like this. And so as I'm talking to him, a white cutlass rolls by and and rolling by slow. And I look at the driver's side and it's little sea dog. And he's rubbernecking. Rubbernecking is a term and they use in LA and maybe use other places, but in LA it's used when people keep turning around looking, doing like this. You know, they keep looking. And so uh, usually when that happens, there's, there's probably going to be some problems, at least from the streets. Now, of course, again, like I told you, last time I had saw little Sea Dog, he had a problem with me and my brother and Smurf and Bobcat. You know, but he had a problem with me. He, he was talking about what he was going to do to me when he catch up with, it, with me. And so when I saw him rubbernecking like that, it bought all that back. But he kept driving. Bob Bobcat's house was right on the corner of 88th Place and Hooper. It was right on the corner, so it was the last house on the street. So when he drove by, and I saw him rubbernecking, and he got to the stop sign, or actually the light. It was a light over there. When, when he got to the light, because now the, the way that he was rubbernecking, I ain't paying attention to him. See, that's one thing about being in L.A. You have to have what they call a situational awareness who's around you, what people are doing, emotions that they're doing. So now I'm paying attention to his car. And when I saw the lights, the reverse lights come on, I said uh, to myself, oh man, it's about to go down. You know, I'm thinking that 
he's still on that stuff from years ago when he was threatening to do A, B, C, D, and E to me when he seen me. So now I'm, I'm sitting here in my, in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to get down. I'm wearing, I'm out here a Muslim now. You know, I, you know, I was sitting here thinking to myself, like, man, I don't, I don't got nothing to do with none of this foolishness no more. I'm going to have to get down with this guy. Because he put the reverse lights on and he reversed back up. Right? So he rolls the window down and he gives the salams. Now, that didn't sway me when he gave the salams because, because I know people know about, you know, assalamu alaikum wa alaikum as salam. They know that. The, 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 the greetings of the Muslims. And I couldn't determine where he was coming from by that. When he gave the salams, I returned him. I returned the salams. I uh, called myself being tactful, you know, and, 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 and not trying to show any aggression, right? So he said, he said something to... I, can, I don't recall what he said. I don't recall what he said. He said something... And so I responded to him, uh, so what's up with you, man? And, or how, how are you doing, man? Or something like that I said to him. And he responded, Alhamdulillah. When he said Alhamdulillah, I said, whoa, what's going on here? I said, you know, the Kufar may know the Salams, but they definitely don't know that term. So when he said Alhamdulillah, he was still in reverse. He put the, the car into, into drive and drove into the driveway. Now, I'm really like, okay, what's going on here? Because he know a little bit too much of the terminology. He, hop out, he hops out and he walks up and shakes my hand. And, uh, and he started using more Islamic terminology. But he's still looking like a crip. <laughs> he's still cripped out. White t-shirt, black... Black jeans creased up like this. But then he starts telling me that last time that he was in jail, he had became Muslim. He had accepted Al-Islam. Well, Al-Alham, he had became a Muslim. So we sat up there and talked. I went to the store, bought him something to drink. We sat and talked for a long time because he saw me throwed out. You know, I was at going to Mashup Movement at that time with Sheikh Farid Abdullah, uh, Rahimahullah. And I was trying to encourage him to come to the masjid. Now, of course, he's way on the east side, and masjid al movement is on the west side in a blood neighborhood. And I believe, to a degree, that's why he didn't come, because although he had accepted Islam, he still was moving as in accordance with the G code, you know, the G code lifestyle. And that's why I think he never went over there. You know, because he was still banging eight, nine East Coast Crip, although he was a Muslim. So, you know, to make a long story short, I end up leaving. And every now and then I would go to the east side and I would drive down Hooper Avenue. I remember one time I was driving down there. I saw him hanging out. I made a U, hopped out on him, talked to him a little bit, you know, encouraged him to get with the, the brothers and, and come to the masjid and to focus on Allah and things of that nature. Uh, you know, and that may have happened, I think I, after that first that, that encounter that I just mentioned, I think I only seen him probably two times and they were both on the east side when I just happened to go go uh, go, go out there. Because I, I didn't really go over there like that. I wasn't, you know, I don't, there was nothing there for me. But when I would drive through there, I would see him and when I would see him, I would pull over and I would talk to him. So anyway, fast forward a little bit. Little C dog end up getting, uh, end up uh, uh, being murdered. Apparently, you know, uh, he was involved with a drug dealer who wasn't a crip, but he was a street guy, drug dealer. And apparently, he had ripped him, this drug dealer, off for some weight from some, you know, a lot of drugs. When I say weight, like large amounts of drugs, right? And, you know, he ended up selling whatever it was that he ripped him off or a portion of uh, what he ripped off. And for a little minute, he was, you know, 
for street standards, he was balling, right? And so he got killed because he was at some 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 female's house, but the way off of Hooper Avenue, there's like an alley. They, their house was right at the alley, and he was turned in, parked in the alley, and uh, in his truck. And you know, they just walked right up on the truck while he was in the truck, and just shot him, shot him dead, right? And so, and then I it, that end up that eventually end up reaching me. And so, I'm I'm saying the story and and telling the story, for one important point that we have to let the remembrance of Allah cause this trembling in our hearts that Allah Taala was referring to in the verse that I opened up with with the hopes that it changes us for the better we can't be people that have one foot in and one foot out we can't be people that are influenced and affected by people that love filth and misguidance. We can't be people that are sticking to ideas like the G-Code that are in reality self-destructive. We t we, a person enters into Islam to get away from all that. To get away from all that. And unfortunately, the downfall of our brother Kirby, may Allah have mercy on him, was the fact that he didn't break away from that old lifestyle in totality. You have to get away from it. It's not beneficial for you. Alhamdulillah, he died as a Muslim with the Shahada, alhamd, but he still was a part of the streets. And this is what led to his demise. This, is, this was the means to his demise. And so I'm saying this to the brothers that are still gang related and gang affiliated, although you've accepted Islam. Your love and your hate is for the sake of Allah, it's not for the sake of anything else. If you have beefs and enemies on the streets, let bygones be bygones. Exit out of that situation. You should not be invested in that anymore. Guidance has come to you by Allah's permission. Guidance has uh, come to you as a bounty and a mercy that Allah is bestowing upon you. Don't take that bounty and that blessing and throw it at the wall by continuing to be a part of a lifestyle that conflicts and contradicts the covenant that you made with Allah where you said ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammad rasulullah because the gang life gang culture gang affiliation being gang related this conf conflicts with the two testimonies that you made that entered you into al islam and it would not be the means of your success. It would be the means for the defeats that you suffer from after Islam. Uh, this is guaranteed that the defeats that you keep facing in life after you've embraced the guidance of, uh, of Allah get most guaranteed that they'll be as a result of your connection with the gang. It is no longer worth your time. So you have to get, you have to move past it. You have to move past it. Or at least you may end up like our brother Kirby, a.k.a. Lil C Dog. So, I, you know, I wanted to present this on the occasion of the death of s -Bone from West Side Foldies. Because Esbon from West Side Fodies was a person that had Muslim relatives. And I saw a video of his over a year ago and I actually thought he had Shahada 
because he said the basmala before he ate his food. But I, I recognize and understand that's because of his Muslim relatives that were speaking to him about Islam, but, but unfortunately he did not die with the Shahada. You know, we got to get past the gang, the gangs, man. We got to get past them. We got to get past them. And a lot to Barak Ta'ala knows best. I'm hoping that, you know, by me telling this story or this incident that happened, that for brothers that may still be from wherever they're from, if you from, if you accepted Islam but you still claiming Den Valain or Crenshaw Mafia or Inglewood Family or East Coast or A7 Gangster or 97 Gangster or A Trade Gangster or Hard Time Hustler or East Side Hustler or or any neighborhood uh, card from the 60s to the 40s to the 90s to the uh, 111s to the 11 deuces on the east side or if you're off in Compton somewhere claiming the Compton gang south side Compton Kelly Park Mona Park Atlantic uh, 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 Atlantic Drive uh, and whatever other gangs that I can't remember at the moment that don't come to mind at the moment listen man the majority of the defeats in life after your Islam is, is going to be as a direct result of what you're participating in as it relates to uh, gang culture, G code living and thinking, and thus forth and so on. Separate yourself. You've been given a gift by being given guidance from Allah to Barak wa Ta'ala. Don't treat this gift like dirt. Don't treat the gift and the blessing that's been bestowed upon you like dirt. Implement it so that it can be the means for to, to uh, the means for you to better yourself. And Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.